multimedia for assessment and distributed collaboration. Um, the idea was that we were going to have an audiographic simulcast or that at the same time there would be a number of people out there on the internet watching this through Blackboard Collaborate. It seems as though we're not going to be successful with doing that. Damn. But I'm trusting that the lecture capture and the um, audio will be recording the session. So fingers crossed somewhere there may be a record of this and I can put it back up onto the internet. And more importantly, I can send it to my brother who to some extent inspired this talk. Um, either the barbarians are at the gates or the sunlit uplands beckon. And those seem to be the sort of polarities in using the online environment. And from this, I also want to say the wide open spaces are problematic. A lot of the work that I've been doing has been around open educational resources, open academic practice, open content, open courseware. And the question, one of the limits, if you like, is what are the limits of openness? Because obviously everything can't be open. If there is no, you know, what, you know, where, you know, life, the universe, everything. Um, what is open? What are the limits to openness? And it, it, there are limits and they are defined in many different ways and that's some of the things that I want to explore. So um, just as serendipity happens, my brother wrote to me about the recent resignation of the president of the University of Virginia and they resigned because the uh, board of regents, i.e. the board of directors, thought that the, that the University of Virginia was being too slow in adopting new technologies, particularly worried about Stanford and Harvard and um, uh, the University of Michigan, University of Pennsylvania, and the various uh, MIT being the, being the signal one perhaps. Um, and my brother, who's uh, dean of um, the school, College of Arts and Sciences at a small, uh, largely teaching focus, uh, university post, as it were, 1992 university in South Carolina um, wrote that it is not that we ignore web-based and internet technologies at our peril. In truth, we ignore the traditional university at our peril. Um, and he talked about the superpositions of randomness that were available in the um, real world bricks and mortar face-to-face -face university and that the superpositions of randomness, the conversations that you have in the bar, the, the, the reading the next article on the page in the journal that you hadn't really intended to read but it was there and you read that and rather than the article that you get out of the library, it's the one that came after it on the page that inspires you that you never would have gotten if you just downloaded the PDF. But interestingly, he made this comment on his Facebook. <laughs> which I came upon as almost as it were at random. So these uh, superpositions of randomness I suggest in the online world are still there, they're just different ones. So related randomness. This is, was presented as a research paper but in fact it's probably a talk that is um, really my first opportunity to reflect at the end of what's been a really busy semester. Uh, doing a lot of a uh, lot of projects, a lot of teaching, um, mostly in the context of new lecturer development, the first steps into learning and teaching, the associate teachers course, and the postgraduate certificate in teaching in higher education. And uh, I mentioned the three topics that I'm going to take. What I'm going to do is take these three topics quite quickly in order. Then we'll have a little sort of pause for some conversation and then after the pause for conversation um, I'll talk briefly about disruptive technologies and where we might be going and we should still finish a half an hour from now. So massive open online courses. I had a request from a participant who wanted to make sure we unpacked our acronym, acronyms. She's new to Brooks and had never heard of the JISC, which is the Joint Information Systems Committee. Had never heard of the RAISE conference, and I don't know what the RAISE conference is. I'm sort of acronym tolerant, I suppose now. But MOOCs are massive open online courses. Old MOOCs, new MOOCs, red MOOCs, blue MOOCs. 
um, old MOOCs. In 2008, MOOCs kicked in, and the original MOOCs had explicit pedagogical perspective. They were very much social constructivist um, concepts, dialogic actor networks, using distributed open source platform components, wikis, WordPress, Moodle, with intentional social media conversations. You were supposed to use Twitter. You were supposed to set up your own Facebook group. And, and offered an open challenge to institutions about access, accessibility. The first MOOC ran at the University of Alberta, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong out there on the internet. Um, and attracted about 3,000 participants, and of whom about 30 were enrolled for credit at the university. They had open challenges to the university's virtual learning environments, challenges to intellectual property, challenges to the problem of how you assess people in these contexts. Some of the examples were, uh, in 2008, connectivism and connected knowledge, uh, DS106, this digital storytelling, brilliant course, runs at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia, uh, personal learning environments, learning and knowledge analytics, uh, various sort of historical constructivist, connectivist moves. New moves from 2011. Uh, new moves hit the scene with a tacit but nonetheless very strong alternative pedagogical perspective. Instructivist, pragmatist, realistic, realist, authentic employment oriented courses using a consolidated platform, incidental social media. Yeah, you can tweet about it, but we don't really care. Um, and if you like, we're an institutional counterposition to these more sort of uh, MOOCs in the wild. The main example was, the first one was the artificial intelligence course that Sebastian Thrun ran at Stanford University, attracted 160,000 people, of whom 300, uh, high 200s took it for credit. 30,000 people actually completed the course and got a non-credit bearing university certificate. Uh, as a result of that, Sebastian Thrun quit Stanford spun out Udacity as a in, uh, an independent open online course provider, largely computer science oriented, but Udacity is now moving into the humanities. There's a series of workshops on contemporary poetry coming up um, through Udacity. As a result, Stanford spun out Coursera. Oh my god, you know, this guy quit us and went and set up something else. Coursera has attracted Princeton, um, University of Michigan, and I think it was Coursera that was flirting with the University of Virginia that led to the uh, president saying, no, we don't want to do this. Um, MITx and our own Open University, Open Learn project. So new moves, very institutional, um, not so much the, um, if you like, adult learning approach. Um, our move um, then as a result of all this action, it seemed like this was something that we should explore. And with funding from the Higher Education Academy, we ran a massive open online course, First Steps into Learning and Teaching in Higher Education. Um, Marion was a tutor on the course. John was a student on the course. Anybody else in this room participate in that course? Yes, <laughs> yes Liz was a, helped develop it and participated to do the video. And hopefully out there in internet land, there's a few other people. Jenny McNess was a tutor and uh, so on. So our MOOC, we ran First Steps Since Learning and Teaching in Higher Education. MOOC problematics, um, they aren't the panacea they might be um, set up to be sometimes. The old MOOCs. Navigation, chaos, multiple platform elements, disorientation, um, individual exposure in public, um, the problem of how you give individual tuition to 160,000 people, for example. Um, but new moves have different sort of problems. They're kind of packaged, delivered content in a box. Automation, the problem of automated marking. A lot of discussions going on now about whether um, Udacity's automated marking systems are um, really telling us whether these people know how to do things well. Um, and the question of a two-tier 
education system starting to spring up. Okay, some of you can afford to actually go to the real MIT, but the rest of you are going to take the massive open online courses from MITx. What will be the value that comes from the thirty, sixty, ninety thousand dollars that you'd pay to be a real student at MIT as against being one of the massive open online participants in MIT? And is the massive open online world actually there to add value to the face-to-face -face experience? So who's, who's feeding off of whom is, a, is an interesting dynamic. And with all MOOCs and all um, distance learning programs, there is the problem of motivation. Um, but MOOCs also have benefits. The old MOOCs have this autonomy. You are an autonomous learner, very much an adult learning, andragogical learning and teaching model. It was all out there for you. You had to make sense of it yourself. You had to be brave to ask questions. Um, the new MOOCs have the benefit of actually having some academic authority behind them. Not that the old MOOCs didn't, but the, the new MOOCs sort of if you like, take a traditional university paradigm and wrap it up in um, sort of prestige and uh, published papers, it's very much sort of the expert on the subject is delivering you a course that you can rely on as being something that is um, credible in the field. And all MOOCs, if you like, give access to people who can't study in um, whatever mode that they might use. This, this, uh, maybe, maybe there is a tutor, but you, know, you, you can't always attend face-to-face -face when you would like to. Um, so there are limits uh, around the question of personal identity, community, and literacy. And I'll be using this identity, community, literacy as a framework for understanding where we're at with these three topics, MOOCs, um, online, uh, multimedia for assessment, and distributed collaborative learning sets. So MOOC limits seem to be this problem of embodiment, um, the problem of learner preference. Some people like it. Some people love the massive open online world. It suits a particular kind of extrovert. Um, different from the kind of extrovert that doesn't mind sort of talking in a room like this, but uh, different that you still need a certain extrovert personality to do it. Um, the serendipity in the community is interesting, and the literacy question. Um, there are genres of speech, genres of communication, which we have to learn. We don't really know how to communicate in this mode yet. Um, and we miss the, the paralinguistic cues. You don't see people being nervous. You don't, you don't sort of get the palpable sense of their presence through whatever kind of um, signals that people send through their attitudes and positions and postures in the room. So the second thing I want to talk about then is uh, multimedia for assessment, post-text problematics, social citation, and the valorization of knowledge. Um, so as well as running massive open online courses, we've been using different forms of assessment in the new lecturers program. Presentations to virtual conferences um, where we ran twice this year, and I know they've been doing them in the business school here as well. Um, now, this has been awfully interesting, and I can't go and show you all of the, conf all of the assessments because of I just thought it would be kind of inappropriate to go and show people's assessed work. Then. But, uh, but I wanted to talk about the diverse practices that came out, largely because we don't know how to communicate in a multimedia world. So the assignment was, the assignment brief, in this assignment you need to draw on your teaching experience and evaluate a formative assessment task involving feed forward. Your online exhibit will be assessed for its strength as an evaluation of the formative. So people are given guidelines to do 12 PowerPoint slides. Well, can I give an audio over? So some people gave audio over PowerPoint. Some people gave PowerPoint with the attendant notes pages. Some people did PowerPoint with a written essay along the side. Some people did 3,000 word essays in 12 PowerPoint pages. Um, there's quite diverse practice going on. Um, 
the markers, we were unfamiliar with the genre. How do we, you know, is it, if somebody sticks strictly to it, there's 12 PowerPoint slides capturing in bullet points the essence of the issue that they were raising, but don't do an audio file, and somebody else does an audio over the PowerPoint, the, the fact is the more, you know, how do, we, how do we value, how do we value the relative um, inputs? How, so what is, leading to the question is like, what is scholarship in this medium? And in coming into this, oh yeah, and there were other multimedia assessment examples. Video essays, a sustained inquiry. Um, John did one in this room. Uh, multimedia learning journals and reflective collections have been used. And we're playing a little bit with audio feedback. So somebody submits a work and we feed back in audio. Now, what I think this all comes down to is that we understand very well how to cite and uh, be scholarly in printed text. But we don't understand very well how to be scholarly in multimedia environments. We do a lot of work in the library teaching people how to cite in text multimedia or web-based sources. How do you cite a television program? How do you cite a website? How do you cite a blog? How do you cite a YouTube thing? But we don't do any work the other way around. When you're presenting in multimedia, how do you cite a text artifact? Do you simply attach a text uh, addendum to your multimedia? So going back to about 2003, Bruce Ingram did a lot of work on what he called ambulating with megafauna or walking with beasts. Uh, asserting that the BBC's Walking with Beasts program was really quite a scholarly um, synthesis of understandings of uh, paleontology at uh, the time, about 2001, 2002, um, and how to uh, represent this as a scholarly text. Um, and a series of citations, ambulating with megafauna in sight you like, Zotero, uh, Jime, sites here, um, but it never really caught on. The virtual world still pushes, uh, the, the real world, uh, the print world, the text-based world, pushes back against the online world. One more signal development, those people who have been reading Kathy Davidson, has anybody been reading Kathy Davidson recently? Kathy Davidson, you watch the video. <laughs> Kathy Davidson is uh, recently ex uh, vice provost at Duke University, famous for um, sort of disruptive technology projects in higher education. Um, in 2003, she gave iPods to every entering undergraduate with a challenge to all of the teachers and all of the people in classes ahead that if you can think of an interesting thing, an interesting educational thing to do with this iPod, then you too can have one too. So there was this sort of, you know, we give it to all of the new students and we'll let the old students and the teachers have one if they can think of something clever to do with it. Ended up giving away about 14,000 iPods. Um, got a lot of criticism for giving toys away to students. But anyway, the students developed apps to detect cardiac arrhythmia and teach cardiac arrhythmia through the use of the iPods. A lot of very clever educational use was stimulated. Um, she's gone on to um, write a book called Attention, which was the text set to our senior management team when they went away to their management conference. So I sort of bring it up here. Our senior management is reading Kathy Davidson. Maybe we ought to read Kathy Davidson too, um, if only to find out what's going on. One of the other things that Kathy Davidson says is that assessment in higher education is essentially broken. And she looks upon things like badges, um, badges for lifelong learning. Um, the badges, a visual representation of a skill or achievement um, the Mozilla Foundation are developing a secure architecture for delivering badges. And interestingly, two professions, again, as the North American perspective, are picking up on badges for lifelong learning as means of assessing achievement. Teachers, because teachers in America are fed up with the no child left behind, which has set national standards for examinations at 
the end of every grade year, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, standardized tests for achievement that need to be passed by students everywhere. And if they don't, we're all familiar with the failing school syndrome, and that's, that's sort of has swept across the states and has started to dominate teacher education and teacher professional development models. So teachers are starting to absent themselves from the formal uh, university sanctioned teacher education programs and they're setting up their own badges for lifelong learning to signal their progression and their professional achievement in the field. And I thought it was only geeks playing games in things like uh, Blip FM and so on. Um, but badges for vets, helping vets find jobs, um, badges for administration in uh, public service, balancing the budget. Um, so the question then comes about employability. If you have 600 badges from the Khan Academy, is that worth as much as a degree in mathematics from Stanford University? And some people think that it is, or at least that it is a valid parallel indication of success in the market. A degree, or a, a, you know, a, attendance at a Coursera course with a self-appointed, self-assessed, uh, sorry, sorry self-appointed group of people validating each other's engagement. <coughs> so, Kathy Davidson talks about badges as uh, robust systems of peer evaluation. And again, you know, uh, you know, I heard a colleague the other day just say, oh, it's just brownie points. It doesn't mean anything. Um, maybe yes, maybe no. Watch out because assessment is interesting. I'm not going to go into this much, the problem of multimedia scholarship. We don't have time. But you'll be very interested to see some of the problems. This was a piece on uh, multimedia scholarship written in 2003 at that sort of burst of the uh, ambulating with megafauna question that came out about multimedia community. Um, if you get a chance, click on the link. And there are some of the links, when you click on the link, you get the underlying text and you click on the links there and you won't like what you see um, because the links degrade. Tim Berners-Lee architect of the World Wide Web said that the strength of the web is the fact that the, you don't have to worry about whether links are persistent forever. Some will degrade over time. But if you go back to this document and you look at the citations on the back of the text, all but one of the links has degraded. One link still points to where it should point. All of the rest of them point to where they should not point. Most of them 404 file not found errors. One of them to a hardcore porn site. So it's, um, it's quite a, a depressing but salutary question about what some of the limits are about online citation. How do we deal with kind of certain knowledge in a world where our primary reference source, the URL, is not itself persistent? So multimedia assessment has some limits, the traditions of the discipline, our identity, our scholarly selves, our ability to reference, and the fact that the genre, again, is new and the links degrade. Finally, being there in the body, distributed learning sets. And this is the last piece of what's beginning to be an argument about the limits of online learning. Um, in the postgraduate certificate in teaching in higher education, we ran learning sets. Um, and we composed, we, we mixed the learning sets up so there's representatives in each learning set from all three of our campuses and we have people on the course who come from other universities. Um, there is an explicit intended outcome which is as a group to produce a seminar addressing a current issue in higher education but some tacit intended outcomes which are to discover ways to work together as a group which allow for distributed collaboration across the three Brooks campuses and several other universities theory being that this is the way that the world of work is going, therefore we need to be able to have graduates and teachers who are competent in this distributed collaborative mode. A um, couple of examples of learning set seminars. Um, these can be found on the podcast producer site. I'm still in beta, so hopefully that 
camera will produce another one of those things similar to this. Interesting, this one, um, this is a photograph live in the room, which is now a video of her presenting live in the room. But in the room, what she's presenting on the screen is a film, a video, that's made by a person who couldn't be there at the time. So you have sort of Russian doll effect. A video of a person presenting a video in a real space, which is then turned into a learning object or an artifact, which could be replayed at any number of times. Um, so Jan is giving his talk here to the room, which is being presented, and then Vic. So distribution worked in two ways in the small groups to collaborate, and in the plenary to attend and review sessions. But the small groups all defaulted to face-to-face. -face. I mean, no matter how much we tried to encourage them to use Google Docs and discussion forums, they all defaulted to face-to-face, -to -face, which disadvantaged the minority in the room. The one person from another university that was in that group who found it was difficult to get to the you know, time that everybody could meet up. Well, that's all right. We'll send you a note by email. Um, and we have the plenary. And the problem in the plenary with the distributed collaboration is that everybody focused on their own presentation. Each group was really, you know, they all really enthusiastic. They came and gave their presentation. And then they didn't go to the other people's presentations. Um, so low attention, low attendance to the other group seminars. So consequently, substantial curriculum input was missed. And it's, so we're, we're sort of struggling about how, how can we either improve the process, improve the learning, um, what do we do to make the distributed learning sets work better? Um, so a controlled classroom environment isn't a bad thing. Distributed collaboration limits. We know ourselves in the reflection of others. There is some cohesion through diversity. And again, back to this. So these three issues seem to me to come down to the same things in the end. It's about who we are as individuals, how we relate to the people around us, and if you like, how we speak to them, how we speak in, that, in those communities. So what I'd like you to do now is if you could turn to the person beside you or in the chat stream if you're in Collaborate. And in the light of massive open online courses, distributed collaboration, can you just explore for sort of five minutes, no more, your, maybe three minutes. What are your limits in respect of the open online world? And then we'd like to get some feedback from you on that. <laughs>
Okay. Um, can I can I just ask to bring it back to the sort of the conversation here, as it were? Um, I'm going to try not to use up. Uh, the next thing we do is go into a break, and it's a coffee break, so I don't want to come between that. Um, we did have a, a late start, so I'm going to sort of if you like cut to the conversation quickly. Um, what, what, where, where do you feel the limits start to hit you in this? world, which might include massive open online courses, might include multimedia for assessment, and might include the sort of distributed, working together in a distributed, collaborative way. Anybody want to shout out first? How do you go? Flip chart. <laughs> well, I guess it's the digital literacy, that's what we were talking about, really, that's that it's not, I mean, we were talking about um, FSL T12 and not necessarily the content of the course being particularly, well not that it wasn't challenging, but it was not necessarily massive new knowledge of how am I going to get my head around that concept. Yeah. But, you know. John, you were yeah, you were you were, you were, you were a student. I was a student, and for me, I think the biggest um, issue is reflecting in terms of my identity as a learner in a completely different um, form. And, and, and again, just to link that to the word form, I've never accessed a blog or a forum. Um, I don't do Facebook or anything like that. And this is all very, very new for me. And um, in terms of the amount of information being presented in the different you know, source of information, all that kind of stuff, got overwhelmed initially. It took some time to navigate around the whole um, the process to actually get an understanding of where I was within that whole different world, I think. Yeah. Uh, that's my reflection, really, the, the learner participant. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and a chance to your identity. Who am I in this space? I know who I am in this space, mm. um, but who am I out there? Yeah. Any other? We focus on a specific tiny problem, which is your transient links. Yeah. And your answer doesn't lead to that. That's not what they're there for. They're not static. Um, so you, it's the one tool for that job. Yeah. You should use your semantic data metadata on wow. your document, and then it can be found wherever it happens to be. Yeah. Should it still even be there? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it's return nothing then. Yeah. yeah. Some of your links return nothing. Yeah, um, one of them returned something sort of reasonably unpleasant. One of them returned today's Washington Post rather than the Washington Post article from 2003 that it was referred to. And the others all replied, this far not found, far not found, the, the degradation. But, but that is an even bigger question there because you know what it means when you say they should be using semantic data and metadata. Anybody else? <laughs> um, and, and it's sort of the, the question that sort of as real life practice lags quite a way behind the the sort of if you like the, the leading edge in these matters. Again, our conversation yeah. in terms of literacy, but we use search engines in very different ways to what probably a lot of people in this room would use them. And we can find information sometimes faster and more efficiently. Yeah. So again it's raising awareness of how people can use this. Yeah. So how people so not only do you have to create artifacts that are useful and interesting and relevant in their own right, you need to create artifacts that can be found in the new way of doing things, if I can put it that way. So you may have a YouTube video. How do you, you know, do you rely on Google for providing the permanent infrastructure for that? Do you put the video in six different places? You know. <laughs> It's, 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 a, it's a crazy new world. Other, other thoughts on? 
Yeah. Very much this question. It's not everything. Certainly not everything for everybody. Um, and I'm going to just. I, I, ha I have to move it on from here. Otherwise, um, we won't get back in time. Um, the question of disruption, disruptive technology. Yes, sir. It's a question from the virtual room. Can you turn the computer on the TV again? Oh, is it still playing? Yeah, it's okay. Hey, hey. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Wave to the virtual room. I'm, I'm so. Um, it's, it's all gone quite sort of pokey up here. Um, so, hello, virtual. So, you know what we haven't done, though? I didn't, I didn't turn on, unless you turned on the recording. Yeah, oh, bless you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Disruptive technology. Now you see it, now you don't. Back to Kathy Davidson very briefly. Kathy Davidson asked a question on her blog. Um, if SOPA and PIPA, or the Digital Economy Act in the UK, they all basically did the same thing, um, trying to, um, as it were, engineer copyright protection into the architecture of the internet. Um, if these had been passed into US law in 2002, would Wikipedia exist today? If they had passed in 2012, which is when they had been on the table when the Digital Economy Act was yet again on the table in this country, would Wikipedia exist in 2022? Why or why not? And she's not saying one way or another, but she's saying that if you can't have an intelligent discussion about this, if you couldn't come up with a view as to the interaction between the internet, internet use, internet technology, and the legislation uh, of government, the, the apparatus of government in your country, then she would say, um, come on, I'm pushing the buttons on the wrong machine. <laughs> if you cannot answer that question, you are not literate, nor are you in control of your life, even if you think you are. And it's, ah, how dare you suggest that to us? You know, what do you mean? Um, and that was the, the challenge that if you did not understand that these issues were actually at the heart of what it meant to be in higher education. She posed this as an entrance examination question for the 21st century university. Um, so there's been a number of watersheds in technology. I'm a person that believes that the internet is one of those watershed technologies kind of up there with steam and Gutenberg and maybe writing and printing certainly up there with perspective. We couldn't see the world in the same way before 1480, 1450 or so. We had a very different way of seeing the world. We couldn't take a perspective on things. From about that time forward, all of a sudden, you could take a different perspective on things. The way we saw the world, the way we were able to talk about the world changed. A similar sort of disruptive technology, I'd suggest, was the cinema, with things like flashbacks, pans, tracking shots. We started to be able to talk about the world in a different way. And I think the internet is a technology that enables us to talk about the world in a different way. Um, the hyperlink concept. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. We're in the middle of it rather than coming out the other end looking back at it. But I think it is of a similar order as those sorts of things. So higher education is yeah, is not squared up. And, that's Sorry, George, we should have told you ages ago. But we've been getting the end of the word. Ah. <laughs> that's not, not still with me, that one. <laughs> um, uh, so higher education is a field of competition for legitimate exercise of symbolic violence, says Bourdieu. It's about power. It's an arena of conflict between principles of rival principles of legitimacy and competition for political, economic, and cultural power. And we know this when we start to see some of the new players that come into this field, BPP University College, Western International University, two large private for-profit universities, BPP, the first one licensed to grant degrees in this country, 
BPP, Western International, both owned by Apollo Global. Apollo Global also owns the University of Phoenix, which is the biggest online provider of university degree courses in the U.S. Again, focusing on teacher education, health care, and public administration. All of these are owned by the Carlyle Group, which is the large venture capital group, whose main focus for their investments is in industries formally provided by the public sector, enabling private participation in industries formally provided by the public sector. Education, health, security, resilience, and defense. And these are all significantly underpinned by learning technologies. Carlisle is a major investor in Blackboard. Um, it all starts to sort of thread for me together, at least into a particular view. So literacy, including digital literacy, is the practice of speaking yourself into a community. It can't be separated from other educational, social, economic, or political developments. It's far more than skills with keyboard and apps. It's how we and our students negotiate this ICT-mediated frontier between rival principles of legitimacy. I say I see the internet as a place of struggle. And it's not about whether you put your stuff online or not. It's how you express your identity in the world that is there for us today, which includes the internet. Back to the comment that my brother said at the beginning. It really isn't about whether or not it's online. It's about what is the purpose of being in higher education. So radical openness is not for everyone. Uh, text citation and commentary asserts itself through every fissure. Distributed collaboration is okay, but we crave and we are good at contact. So anyway, um, a quick reflective ramble across three interesting developments, and I hope to be able to write this up as a paper over the summer. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, happy to carry on questions. We're five minutes late for coffee, and we come back into this room for our next session at 11.30. And 11.30 is the um, keynote, um, Effective Change Agents in Higher Education. Excuse me, Effective Change Agents. Yes, Rhonda. Uh, it's, it's, uh, a quick for ideas of online teaching courses live here. Yeah. 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 Yeah